Principles of Macroeconomics, Chapter 21, Globalization and Protectionism, Professor Wagner. This chapter speaks to protectionism, international trade and its effects on jobs, arguments supporting and support of restricting imports, how governments enact trade policy on a regional, global, national level, and the trade-offs of trade policy. So I'll use flat screen competition as an example. Uh, the market for flat panel displays in the United States is pretty much huge, insatiable even. Manufacturers of flat screens in the United States must compete against other manufacturers around the world. And believe me, there's many who can do it cheaper and better. We can internally. We have to consider the trade-off, whether this is something that's necessary to the national infrastructure or not, or something we can uh, continue to, to work with. Protectionism is an indirect subsidy from consumers to producers. In effect, that you know, if you uh, produce, if you're producing something where your comparative advantage is weaker than in other countries, your good is going to become more expensive. The long and short of it, they uh, do. Uh, the policy, these kind of policies shield domestic producers and domestic workers from foreign competition. There's two arguments at play. Granted, the goods are more expensive, but if you go full glo full on globalism and you ship off all the manufacturing to other countries where labor is pretty much you know pretty much free almost or comparatively free, uh, what you do is you cut out. A great cross section of the demographic earning capability for for each worker, and so if you reduce or eliminate the middle class, the company who's trying to sell their product inside, you know, let's say our country, the United States, um, might have a more difficult time down the line of uh, finding a buyer for the product simply because people do not have the disposable income to buy that product. So um, that's an extreme. Uh, certainly, we're not quite there yet, but there's probably some happy balance we're going to need to find in the uh, advent of the current crisis. So there are tools. You know, tariffs is definitely a good import quotas, non-tariff barriers. Uh, sometimes it can, and it has happened historically on a number of occasions, a few, a handful at least, uh, where there are a total embargo of goods based on some political or economic uh, rationale that doing business with, uh, you know, country B is just completely unpalatable and there's really no realizable advantage. And it seems like it's all one way. Um, you know, that, you know, or let's say they could be at war. Lots of, lots of reasons why embargoes would take place. They have happened historically on a number of occasions, but it's really not the focus of this discussion. So there will be import quotas and non-tariff barriers. So basically countries will only allow a certain amount of stuff to come in their country. Uh, non-tariff barriers, basically rules, regulations may make it more difficult or costly to import the product, meaning they gotta you know, meet certain safety or origin regulations. I mean, we don't wanna have kids' toys painted with lead-based paint and, you know, because that's a health concern. Uh, so we would probably you know, disallow the import of such product. On the other hand, uh, you know, goods that are superior in nature, let's say chips from Taiwan or something like that, uh, will allow a certain amount in. But once again, we don't want to go ahead and cut out Intel or any of the other chip manufacturers in the United States. Once again, you got to maintain at least a solid footprint on essential technologies inside your own country. Uh, WTO, once again mentioned, negotiates reductions to barriers and tries to adjudicate complaints of violations of international trade policy. I will just go ahead and say, and it's my opinion only, you can feel differently and it counts for nothing as far as I'm concerned in terms of what you get on the course, but I'm not a big fan. And uh, they've done a miserable job. Uh, and I think the current, uh, you know, trade war involving oil and other products and just general disagreements about trade in general globally at this current point in time uh, speaks to really the miserable level of job they've done. Supply and demand analysis of protectionism. 
Okay, so non-economist. Okay, restricting imports may appear nothing more than taking sales from a foreign producer and giving them back to domestic producers. But you know, it could also basically uh, if it you know cost the opportunity cost for us to produce the same good is much higher in our country naturally. That's going to be passed on to the consumer. So that fifteen dollar toaster may all of a sudden become a twenty five dollar toaster. Now, an argument could be made both ways. Well, people just won't be gobbling up toasters at twenty-five dollars, but then again, it's more of it's more of a uh, need than you know, more of a need item for most people than a comfort item. Uh, we tend to like our conveniences here in the United States, so that'll they'll probably go ahead and buy it anyways. And then the argument also goes, gee, how often you got to buy a toaster? And you know, once every ten years, or until the thing breaks down, and then you know the uh, Domestic uh, producer might uh, try to help justify the cost of the uh, higher cost toaster by making sure maybe a little extra quality is uh, tossed into the uh, mix so that people think it's a reliable brand and worth the money. And so cheapest isn't always best. Okay, an example of sugar trade between Brazil and the United States. And so before you know, before trade, the equilibrium price of Brazil is 12 cents a pound and 24 cents a pound in the United States. So we're taking a look at uh, point E here versus point E there. And you can see the differences are considerable. And so when trade is allowed, businesses will buy cheaper uh, sugar in Brazil and sell it in the United States naturally. So uh, Brazil, they produce much cheaper syrup, uh, sugar in this example, so there'll be a certain amount of imports allowed or exports allowed, and we don't want to cut out on everybody who produces sugar in the United States, so you know there'll be some allowable amount of import, and so when in when the trade is allowed, they can. Uh, you know this will result in higher prices in Brazil and lower prices in the United States, but. Maybe both parties can stomach it, and that's where the agreement point comes from. Ignoring transaction costs, uh, prices should converge to 16 cents per pound, with Brazil exporting 15 tons and the United States importing 15 tons. If the trade is only partially open, partly open between the countries, it'll lead to an outcome between free trade and no trade possibilities. And so basically that the free trade is no restrictions, no trade, we can go ahead and say embargo, another word for free trade of sugar. Um, free trade results from gains for trade, so total surplus increases in both countries, as the blue shaded areas show. However, there are clear income distribution effects. Producers gain in the exporting country while consumers lose. And in the imported country, consumers gain and producers lose, lose. So in all things trade and all things economics, all things tax, there are always winners and losers. So it's a rel it is a relativity thing uh, where a situation gets negotiated where both people say, you know, I think we can handle the, you know, we can handle the import of 15 tons and not really feel it so bad at the same time. Uh, Y'all can export your 15 tons, and that both sides realize some nominal benefit, and it's agreeable to both parties. The effects of trade barriers, sugar supply and demand. So when there's free trade, equilibrium is at point A. When there is no trade, uh, the equilibrium is at point E. So no trade, obviously the quantity is somewhat reduced and the price is somewhat higher, whereas free trade puts the quantity demanded over here and uh, people just, you know, simply want more. International trades, how it affects jobs, wages, and working conditions. And this is also something fairly contested in uh, the present day uh, argument about whether you know trade and economics in our country and others. Uh, in theory, imports injure workers in several ways: fewer jobs, lower wages, poor working conditions. Um, you know, all you got to do is take a look at uh, you know the the uh, you know people protesting for the fifteen dollar 
an hour minimum wage because really there's an overabundance of low low skill low wage jobs available in the country uh, as opposed to middle middle uh, income type of wages associated with manufacturing because it's all pretty much gone overseas so protectionism in the sense could save jobs and uh, once again there may be a balance to be had here where maybe a certain degree of protectionism is necessary to protect a given income group because they produce and they pay taxes. They're also the future consumers of the goods of all the companies that are selling products in the United States. So if we're buying strictly foreign goods because they're cheaper and better than you know the domestic manufacturers will quit producing and then at a certain point we'll become beholden to the other party. So that's a, that's a tightrope to be balanced. Lost sales equals lost jobs. So basically, once again, if your uh, consumer base has significantly reduced income to, with which to buy uh, discretionary goods or or goods that they are that are essential, um, that that creates longer term problems. The U.S. International Trade Commission did talk about barriers of trade and predicted that reducing trading barriers would not lead to an overall loss of jobs. Um, true, but uh, it does it does shift the emphasis on the types of jobs that people can have. Yes, there will be jobs, but what quality of jobs? Either they'll be very highly specialized, where salaries are very high in conjunction with that or they'll be very uh, low because they're service jobs that require little skill or aren't paid well and so if you don't have anything in the middle uh, it does create a uh, negative situation for those trying to sell goods internally and we'll say the united states trade and wages you know so basically you know there is a trade amounts to an economy that can produce by letting firms play to their comparative advantage. Trade will cause the average level of wages in an economy to rise. Barriers to trade will reduce the average level of wages in an economy. And so the concern is while globalism may be benefiting high skilled, high wage workers, it imposes cost on low skill, low wage U.S. workers. Absolutely true. Um, but about half of U.S. trade is industry trade. Many low-skilled workers hold service jobs at import. It's from low-wage countries that cannot replace. So, like I said, winners and losers. And if you have too many, let's say, at the top level of specialization and the wage scale, and, you know, it's a goodly number, but at the same time, it can't flow to everything. And everybody else, let's say, is working someplace where their wage is $10 an hour. Uh, and it's a barely, you know, it's barely subsistence wage. Um, they're just focused on, focused on the essential, and certainly the economy won't grow. Uh, businesses will still be challenged to be able to sell product at a certain point if this is a, is a sustained situation. Labor standard and working conditions. And so, if you talk about low-income countries around the world. Uh, that basically you could say in many places that we do business with there are just simply are no labor standards and so you know safety is not exactly job one and uh, the, yeah so like life is cheap labor is cheap uh, the philosophical view of societal well-being is much different than let's say what we hold favorable here uh, but you know so that may be a cynic point of view. At the same time, there are people who seem to have little conscience about any of that. It's okay to go ahead and use child labor in Bangladesh to make uh, Ralph Lauren shirts or whoever produces their goods there, that sort of thing. Uh, there's an increasing conscience, you know, in you know the the American psyche about these sorts of things, and it's really not real acceptable, less acceptable than it once was. Um, so when you think about other countries, it draws some distinction what's truly unacceptable and painful to think about. So you don't really want to think about your goods being made by prison labor in some country where it's basically free. 
And so, you know, labor standards, working conditions, you know, they're important here in the United States and other developed countries, but not everybody holds that dear. The United States is not a world leader in government laws to protect employees. Matter of fact, only one of 41 countries does not provide mandated paid leave for new parents. So, uh, you know, it's uh, you know there are things that other countries do better in regard with respects to their workers. Um, you know, to illustrate their point, let's say the average European worker gets six weeks or 30 days of paid vacation a year, compared to the average of two weeks of paid vacation in you know U.S. companies. So we are somewhat viewed as a workaholic nation. Uh, we're not always thinking of what's best for the worker, but we're better than a great many, but we're not necessarily by far the best. Uh, and this is a topic of a great deal of discussion of what, you know, we should relook at in terms of how workers are regarded in the workplace. Arguments in support of restricting imports, uh, Infant industry argument, anti-dumping, environmental protection argument, unsafe consumer products argument, national interest argument. And so these are all definitions, things you wanna know for a test. And so infant industry argument blocks all imports for a limited time to give the infant industry a little time to mature before it starts competing on terms with the global economy. Dumping is a, is a tactic that's used, you know, extensively in today's uh, global economy. Right now, the oil war between Saudi, Russia, and us, and we'll say maybe even Mexico, I think, was in the mix. Uh, everybody's dumping oil to the degree that it's damaging the uh, you know, companies. And what the idea behind dumping is, is it's a it's it's a tactic to try and gain a monopoly, you know, <coughs> a monopoly on a given commodity. And so oil was the current thing before it was uh, Chinese steel. They dumped it at such a price that our steel industries began to shrivel up and blow away. And we don't produce so much steel in the United States. Uh, there's also an appetite for German steel and Japanese steel because they can do it better and more efficient, more efficiently. And so our industry has suffered, you know, steel industry has suffered greatly. And yet, um, that's also something that could stand to relook because it is a, uh, you know, it is something that's essential to our, our national infrastructure. And so why would they, you know, go ahead and do this sort of thing? Why would this dumping, t you know, take place? Uh, innocent explanation demands supply set market rates, not the cost of production. Sinister explanation is part of a long-term strategy to drive out the domestic uh, competition and then raise prices. This is called predatory pricing. Guess what? Definition number two is probably what's really going on. Not much innocence involved in this. Race to the bottom. So this is when countries with the lowest environmental standards or pressures to create a product. Uh, it, you know, does not, you know, really it's, they're not there to describe reality or other factors. It's just really, what can we do to uh, make it, you know, the cheapest we can? And then uh, other countries who see that it's actually, you know, polluting the environment way too much and that the uh, workers are completely maltreated, uh, then they, you know, then the international community will step in and probably uh, block the international trade with that particular country. Unsafe consumer products argument, plenty of those. Everybody's got different ideas of safety. Um, you know, examples of recall. So basically, you know, Mattel recalled 2 million toys in Port John due to the lead and paint. So that was the example I used earlier. Frankly, it's one of the more famous ones. It's certainly not the only one, and it's not just China. Um, Japan blocked imports of U.S. wheat because of concerns of GMO. Wheat might be in, you know, included in shipment. So there, a lot of people don't like what I term as Franken food, basically genetically modified food that, you know, repels bugs better, grows bigger, better, 
and all that because they feel like you're messing with the gene structure of the uh, product and it could have negative health effects on those consuming that product so there's a lot of people that are fearful of the uh, ingestion of such you know genetically modified products the national interest argument probably the strongest argument prevailing today and oil is certainly one of them materials of technologies that might have national security applications uh, this argument for protection proves weak um, I'd say at the time this slide was made probably true right now I think it's a lot less weak and uh, once again it's an opinion and opinions don't show up on any of the tests or assignments so I'm just going to speak out on this anyways in the sense that uh, we have to relook at what's you know near and dear to us and what's what you know is in our national interest if we want to protect things that are germane to the national infrastructure and we do that to some degree we do that with the automakers the big three and the reason we do that is they may be called upon to uh, produce something other than the automobiles that they normally produce and so now they're producing uh, ventilators by uh, War Production Powers Act enacted recently. And this happened also during World War II instead of, instead of uh, cars and trucks, it was airplanes and tanks. So it's not exactly the first time that's been enacted. We need a certain amount of, we need to be able to produce our own goods. Otherwise, uh, should a international conflict arise with another country or group of countries uh, we might find ourselves in a compromise situation these are concepts and ideas uh, that countries or groups of countries or consortiums of countries will use to uh, kind of preordain certain types of trade activity amongst themselves they'll have a general agreement on tariffs and trade or they'll have a completely free trade agreement or common market meaning that uh, you know free it's completely uh, free market and then economic union where a group of countries you know allow free trade amongst themselves but you know external trade policy you know with others you know might be different maybe not such as, as favorable um, these are all pretty good concepts right now I think the free trade idea of the most many economists and I think in an in the ideal world I think that would be great but if it has too many negative consequences and many people feel it does um, it's not it's you know just because it's uh, utopic doesn't mean it's something that's gonna happen or should happen at the same time um, you know there should be a general you know there should be a general agreement on tariffs and trades but it has to be you know a uh, fair by and on a bilateral level but this, this is how people decide to do this sort of thing and and the different ways this is enacted regional trade agreements are several the European Union that's amongst themselves uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, NAFTA, that's been replaced by the, uh, you know, the U.S., Canada, Mexico agreement. And uh, I think that perhaps that agreement is a little bit more fair, perhaps, at least in the mind of some. Uh, the Asia Pacific uh, Economic Co uh, Cooperation. And so the trend in the last 60 years have been lower barriers to trade so the average uh, level of tariffs on goods and imported goods charged by industrialized countries 40% in 1946 but that was fresh after World War II to less than 5% in 1999 1990 um, world's an ever-changing place I think that those numbers are about to readjust trade policy always has trade-offs the average person you know, over time, the average person gains from international trade. That's true. Uh, average person is hypothetical because what constitutes the average person? The average person, let's say, in the United States is not necessarily equate with the average person, in, let's say, a, a global society. So your economic median certainly is going to be much higher in the United States than, let's say, the, you know, the median income 
uh, uh, from a global standpoint. So we're talking about apples and oranges, and there are trade-offs as a result. Disruptive market change uh, is new product uh, and production technology it disrupts the status quo in the market. This has happened a number of times. Uh, probably the greatest example of it, not really spoken about much in recent times, but the uh, the space exploration industry, particularly what we did in the 1960s and what the Russians did in the same time period has led to a tremendous amount of technological innovation that we enjoy today. And it has propagated new technologies on a level that probably would not have taken place without, you know, that type of R&D effort being put, you know, put into uh, technology. So there are, you know, some some, some uh, actions, behaviors uh, can actually accelerate the use of technology, uh, but you know, certainly the space race was a disruptor, and a dis uh, also wars also tend to be disruptors, not just in the uh, fact that people are at war with each other, but once again, innovation on new uh, weapons, strategies, tactics, and other you know means of communication and everything so these are influencers they're not always positive they're not always negative but they do impact uh they do create disruptive technologies in the sense that there's a, simply a new and better way to do things so uh, other forms of manufacture of maybe a similar good just simply become outmoded and it will be replaced by the new chip by the new technology or process. This ends chapter 21.